We have Insights as a Service, the future of live sports data. Sports fan engagement is changing and changing very, very fast. I think we can all agree. Uh, this session will explore how data and analytics are enhancing the live sports experience uh, and discuss the advances in managing and sharing data and how it is revolutionizing sports from broadcasting to fan experiences. To moderate this panel, a former colleague of mine, Mr. James Miner. And joining James will be Duncan Alexander, VP, Data Editorial, Analytics and Innovation, Perform Opta. There's a hell of a title. Please take the stage. Maurizio Barbieri, Head of Sports Partnerships for SEA in Greater China, at Twitter, of course. Missing the beard. I wanted to see the beard this year. But it's gone. He promises he's going to grow it again for Christmas. Yeah, it does grow naturally. Yeah, yeah. It's just <laughs> uh, a man with a great game of golf, Craig Harvey, director, APAC, Delta Tray. <laughs> Lance Petey, general manager, Southeast Asia, ESPN. <laughs> and I will hand over to my friend and former colleague, Mr. James Miner, to uh, to take the. To start the whole thing. Off you go, James. Thank you, Jason. Good morning. All right. As opposed to yesterday, my mic will actually work, which is a really nice welcome addition. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for bearing with the traffic and the congestion and the changes. It's really nice to see you. Um, you do have an amazing panel. Please remember that these insights are about the experience of sports and that these people are the people who make that sports experience richer, deeper, and more meaningful to fans around the world. So I'm really honored to be here. Um, they, they are reservoir dogs, but they're the dogs I love. So I'm going to start off with a, a highly relevant topic. Um, Lance, welcome back to Singapore. Um, Thank you, James. We're going to ask you about your new home and other things later, but they, you just had a deal that you signed locally. Can you tell us about that deal and what it means for sports fans in Singapore? Um, yes, I can tell you a few things about that deal. Um, it was a bit of a no-brainer for us, the, the, the partnership with Media Corp, um, for two, two elements, really. Um, first of all, there's a commercial element and representation of our ad sales. Um, we've attached ourselves to one of the biggest sales teams in the country. Um, and they have a very sophisticated setup, um, which works well with um, our digital layers, if you like, for the fan. And then I think the whole fan experience is at the centerpiece of why we're doing this. Um, when we come to localise in a particular region, we want to do it from the ground up. And working with someone like Media Corp allows us to do that. Um, and the one thing that is really exciting about this partnership is that we will be launching a local edition of ESPN.com for uh, Singapore in the coming months. So very excited by that. They're the two main elements. I could talk a lot longer, but want to get some of these fantastic other guys <laughs> a chat. Um, OK. Uh, we think it's really wonderful that ESPN is refocused on this part of the world. And we do believe that you provide one of the premier sports experiences powered by the global ESPN data network and information. Yeah, it's, it's a hugely important part of what we do. I mean, we still produce so many studio programs, and at the center of that is live stats and data. So that, that fan experience is essential to everything we do. Excellent. All right, guys, um, we just had a World Cup. And uh, so we can kind of frame this conversation around World Cup and how World Cup kind of defines an experience. So for me, taking television and putting it on a mobile device is not a strategy. You have to take television and enrich it with data. So during the World Cup, there were some things that happened. So the last World Cup, we had a free kick that kind of was a live event that was powered by Insight. So, Duncan, can you tell us a little bit about Ronaldo's free kick? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, if you might remember that uh, Spain and Portugal played out a pretty good game at the start of the World Cup. Um, Portugal 3-2 down with not much time remaining. Ronaldo stepped up to, to take a free kick, which in club football would be you know, not a 
dead cert, but a, a pretty good opportunity. Um, but through the fact that um, at Opta we'd collected data on Ronaldo's, Ronaldo's entire career, we um, had pushed out a fact at the last World Cup that he'd never scored from a free kick, which got a little bit of traction. Um, two years later at the Euros, again, um, got a bit more traction. Um, so we knew coming into this World Cup that you know he'd never scored a free kick at the World Cup. Um, and by this point, it really had kind of disseminated around the world, you know, thanks to you know, channels like Twitter, obviously. Um, and then, lo and behold, finally, with his 45th free kick in an international tournament, which is quite a lot, um, he scored. And obviously, it was a massive moment in one of the biggest games in the World Cup. And it's very interesting because it, it's when data crosses from being just uh, a stat, if you like, into something that is essentially the conversation that everyone around the world is happening, uh, having. So, you know, the number 45 was just everywhere after that went in. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of satisfying to see, you know, a kernel of information that has kind of developed into this sort of monster over time. Tim Maurizio, you say that more information like this is more fun. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I guess that um, you know, like like you said, just watching uh, just watching something is not enough anymore. We want to know more, and now we also have channels where uh, we can uh, uh, talk about uh, what we are watching in real time. Uh, Twitter is one of them, of course, and I think that is the the most uh, relevant when it comes to sport. And this is the perfect example. People were talking about this. Uh, 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 about what was happening on the pitch, anchored by a bit of information, and all of a sudden is uh, is going to score, is not going to score. It, it kind of uh, gives you uh, adds to the suspense of the moment, and uh, whatever happens after that doesn't matter, right? He misses, oh, he's a choker. He scores, he finally broke the curse, and and then you move on and you keep on talking on uh, with this. Uh, th this is uh, why, um, I mean, broadcasters are investing in, uh, in providing more information, more data, because they know that uh, it allows them to have uh, a more engaged audience, not only watching the big screen, but also while they are, uh, they are chatting with friends. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to, to keep the attention uh, high. We all want to be the guy that knows uh, more than, than the other guy. We want to win uh, the sports bar conversation. And Twitter is the sports bar of, uh, of the World Cup. And uh, who has the, the, the best data and the best uh, information wins. We know that that is, it, Twitter has powered some of the greatest sporting experiences that we've delivered. And so therefore, yes, uh, I think that it's a primary channel. Craig, is this really that easy? I mean, you just came back from the Asian Games. Um, again, what a couple of sleepless nights there. Um, Only two. How many? How many data points were you guys monitoring? What were the challenges that you faced at the Asian Games, and and why did you make it look so easy? Yeah, I think a lot of experience. I think interestingly, on on just quickly on the Ronaldo point, I think one of the the best analysis of that came out of China, ironically, um, on Tencent, who had taken a lot of the data and, and used kind of cutting edge technology to cut the clip in a, in a, in a, in a really cool way. I, I may, may have made it on Twitter, but it was phenomenal what I think storytellers are doing now with, with technology around them. It, it is taking data and, and, and making it more immersive and more um, wrapped up into a visual experience, and ultimately, that's that's roughly where we sit in that in that ecosystem. And um, I think important for us is that we kind of we start off by being data agnostic. So you know, often work with Opta, you know, your Premier League deliveries and, and so on and so forth. Fox Sports Asia here, we're using their data to create visual stories. But um, yeah, I think when it comes to pure data, the the, the challenges are getting it to the audience, visualizing it. A Asian Games, I think we, we had about over a million data points in under two weeks um, of just the vital result data. So not left foot, right foot kick, and you know all the kind of additional editorials. It was just the vital statistics that everybody needed to know. And you know, visualizing a million data points in, in any sort of experience is 
to make it easy to find that information is actually quite difficult and takes a, a lot of practice. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, I think there's an element of that that um, comes with personalization. I think finding that data is, is crucial and we have all have that job to deliver that. Um, I think, you know, I spoke about the localization piece and how we're working with the likes of Media Corp, um, TV5 in the Philippines for that expertise at a ground level and trying to grow it up for the fan experience. But the personalization piece is really important to be able to serve that data. There are Ronaldo moments for fans everywhere. Um, obviously, the scale of that is huge on the World Cup stage, but once you connect it to a fan, an Arsenal fan, and we know that that Arsenal fan has, you know, these amazing stats that Optus pulling out that are just as vital for someone that's working on their fantasy league or etc. So, I think there's two elements of personalization that we look at um, from an ESPN perspective. One is intrinsic personalization, which is basically when you're telling us you're registering and you're telling us what your favourite leagues and favourite teams are, which allows us to serve that up. But then there's the extrinsic personalization, which is when we identify that you are an Arsenal fan and that you've clicked on 10 different articles about Arsenal um, or about, you know, if they're strikers off the mark or whatever, we can start delivering that experience. So I think it's, it's vital that we grab this data and serve it into the fans through that process of personalization. Agreed. Yeah, it, it, it's the start of everything there, right? It's what story do you want to tell? And I think for us, when where we kind of differentiate, I guess, in the marketplace is when there is somebody that wants to tell something unique or ultimately wants to own the data. Um, you know, UEFA, FIFA, ATP, the, the kind of list goes on of the, of the bigger names that do it. And it's to start with a story and actually work back the way. So what is the story you want to tell? What platform are you going to use to tell that story? It might not be your own. It might be somebody else's. It, 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 it can be a, a myriad of things these days. It can be even in TV. And then work back to, OK, what data do we need to collect? How do we collect that? And then that's when you start to use the people around you, the technology um, as available, what they, and then package it in a way that allows you to tell the story. And then it's over to you guys to get the data back to keep pumping the right stuff in. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, you know you go back ten years and people thought that the the data should lead it. Um, so you give people loads and loads of numbers, and it was like go and you know go and work out the story for yourself, and that doesn't work because most people don't want to, and most people can't really because it's just a load of numbers. Um, and I think the key word is authenticity, and it's almost impossible to kind of define how you do that. But if you're a fan of a team you know, Arsenal or whoever, even a smaller team, particularly a smaller team, um, if someone's writing or, you know, creating content on that team and they're not authentic, then immediately your brain switches off. And it's really hard to get that level of uh, authenticity across. So when we kind of hire people to work in data editorial, the key thing is that they're a massive fan of that sport. Because if, if they're not, then it, that will come across. With the advent of fans bringing digital into the stadium in ever-increasing numbers, this conversation is happening live. Um, moving beyond fixtures and providing basics, uh, what are the things that excite you in terms of insights? So again, we need to provide bot the scores, the fixtures, everything else. It's mandatory, right? Fans demand this. But what are the things you think that are happening now that are increasing the depth of the experience within sports? So we just did one World Cup. We're going to do another, right? We have the Rugby World Cup, Cricket World Cup, and then 2020 Japan. What are the things that you see being enrichments to the experience powered by insights? He's gone. <laughs> um, so I, obviously I can't say too much about what's coming down down the track with FIFA, but looking back to, to this summer in terms of what innovations we started to bring in, I think it, I think data insights are, are one thing, and I think there's people in this room that probably do it a lot better than we do. Um, what we're also looking at is that the experience isn't just about the data; it's 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 immersive around around everything now. So we're actually taking match data, in, in fact tracking data 
to allow us to now know where the game is happening on the pitch, to be able to select the right microphone, to bring in the best audio to now match what are significant advancements in video technology that we were talking about yesterday with cloud and the Akamai delivery and now how we can get, you know, superb bit rates into all different territories. I mean, you know, look at Olympics, it's gonna be 8K in Tokyo. They were doing 8K from, from Russia. Um, it's huge bandwidth. You, great if you have a nice video, but what else comes with that? And, you know, the insights are there already and, and the way that we overlay them will just get more innovative and, and more authentic. <clears throat> but it's the rest of the experience that comes around that, then the video, the audio, the VR, um, and everything else that's coming, I think, down the track. for. And it's going to be, I think, a really difficult delivery come Tokyo because the amount of bandwidth needed to do what people's imaginations are is, is going to be huge. Uh, if, if I may add, uh, is um, I think that to, to, to Duncan's point, uh, if, uh, if you provide something that people can relate to, they will start uh, talking about it. Again, across all platforms, whether it's a uh, club's uh, website, whether it's Twitter, whether it's another platform, it doesn't matter. Uh, if, if that uh, piece of information is important, people will, uh, will start talking mm -hmm. about it. And uh, you have a much uh, more immersive uh, uh, experience. You're sitting at home watching it, but uh, everybody is doing something else on a tablet or on the phone. You are at the bar, uh, you're talking to the people to your left, uh, but you are also talking to the people, to your friends that didn't make it. You are at the stadium and are like you're missing a great game, right? Uh, uh, all this information probably will, uh, will improve, will eventually improve, for sure, because we, we've seen uh, what, what happened, right? I think that... Uh, it is a good opportunity for everyone involved uh, to keep doing what we are doing, uh, finding the right uh, moments and finding the right uh, levers to pull uh, the right uh, triggers. And uh, also the industry will become much richer because what do you do with these conversations? What do you do with, uh, with these data points that, uh, that you are using? Uh, so that uh, a brand can be attached to that, uh, uh, whatever it is. Who's going to score the next goal? Uh, and, and you drive the conversation uh, around that. And thanks to the fact that it's going to be faster, because it's true that you're going with 8K, but uh, we are also going to have 5G, which is 10 times faster than the 4G, right? So we, we are all going to have a lot of information. The matter is what kind of story we are telling, and if they are interesting enough, uh, Boom, the deal is done. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned brands there because I think that's been a big growth area for us over the last year or so because I think brands realize now that uh, through data you can kind of activate stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be able to. You, you know, you might sponsor a, an individual team or player, but data allows you to talk about the whole league, the whole competition, and it brings everyone kind of to the party. Yeah, I mean, it used to be numbers, boring, zzz. Now instead is numbers, people are talking about it. Uh, is this guy better than the other guy? Yes, because he won more. No, because he won less. And we have data to support these arguments. We want to win, win that argument. So if there are enough people talking about it, all of a sudden brands to want to be part of that conversation exactly like they want to be part of the signage. Around the, around the stadium, right? Uh, they, they want to be where the fans' uh, attention uh, is. I mean, our mantra is we want to bring uh, everyone, uh, including the, the, the brands, when uh, our fans are the most receptive, the most uh, attentive, the most uh, engaged. Uh, so I, I, I find it this, uh, um, I would find surprising that this doesn't happen sooner rather than later. I think, I think the interesting bit, though, in, in your experience, are the brands wanting just the data or are they wanting unique data? They don't want unique data, but they want a unique kind of take on it. So that might be, you know, fitting into their brand message or they might be saying, look, you know, we want something that's different to someone else. Come up with something. They, you know, they're usually quite open, but they, yeah, they do want an individual take. That's what we're finding is that they want to try and tell a different story. So how many goals have been scored with an Adidas boot? Or, you know, when you run in an ASIC shoe in the Asian games, are you more likely to win by one one-hundredth of a second? 
um, it, it's, I think that's, that's going to be the big advancement, I think. Yeah, is, yeah is absolutely. So. I mean, you, you start from, uh, from a very generic standpoint where, uh, okay, these people are talking about this, so I must be in that conversation. And then uh, you also have, uh, uh, oh, I build uh, microprocessors that are very fast. Uh, how fast uh, is this guy going? How fast was that shot? Uh, and so on and so forth. You find uh, those, con those points, those connecting dots that are uh, perfect for that brand. They, they really, the, the, the advertising, the sponsorship is not even intrusive because you are talking about the same thing, uh, but you are also delivering the commercial message. The brands are only going to come once you've got that authentic connection with the fan. And I think to pick up on the authenticity point, you, fans will find you out really quickly if you don't have, have the right mix. I think a, a really good example for us at the moment is in terms of the, the local editions that we're rolling out around the world, which we have over a dozen now local editions throughout the world. And one is in Australia. Um, the Australian local edition, which launched in March 2016, we're now reporting on AFL and NRL, very local leagues. Now, to find our position in the market, you are dealing with some behemoth sort of media coverage there that you like. So for us as ESPN, how do we come in and give something a bit different? Well, we find partners that we actually will be able to give that authentic layer and tell sort of the game around the game, which is what we try to specialise in. So we've partnered with Champion Data, who are the best in AFL coverage, um, and brought them into the mix rather than thinking, oh, we're ESPN, we can do this ourselves. Um, it's, it's just about understanding the different assets of what you have. I think Crick Info is another a very different example, again, from the ground up, 25 years old this year. Um, we've got the data there and the, the depth of stats to match the sort of ESPN way, but for something like AFL, a very local league, don't pretend, don't, don't try and bring in a layer that's going to be found out by the fans. Partner with someone who knows it really well, like a champion, bring in some Opta analysis and create that experience that, that's the ESPN way. You yeah. are such a good panel. Crick Info is a great shout because it, you know, it's clearly the best resource for cricket and it was the inspiration behind our football kind of query tool that we built because it was like we want the football version of Crick Info. So, and I think you mentioned earlier about the agnostic. I think that's a, a growth thing really. You know, people are less, it's less um, my data set is the best now. It's more what can, what's the best thing we can get out of different data sets that we put together. And I think that's a big change. Uh, it's definitely changed. You know, we, we powered Star Sports back in 20, from 2012 before it all became hot star and you know when we sat in the this amazing boardroom <clears throat> in mumbai and you know what's the challenge and it was to beat crick info um you know now i think we've, we've had, had that one a few times yeah it now might be a you know a, a different a different challenge with respect yeah, <laughs> yeah with the <laughs> utmost respect um so yeah i, th I think i think you're right i think it, it is changing and we you know, we have to use the best that's already out there rather than reinventing the wheel. And, um, you know, I think everybody has big data. I think that's part of the, the biggest challenge now is we have too much data. Um, it's knowing what to do with it is, is the key. Everyone can collect it and sit on it, but it's actually of no value sat in a vault. What's and the you, impact of too much data? If you don't, if you don't data, know what to do with it, then you are, exactly. It all sounds great. You guys are doing a great job. It's almost what is the impact of too much data. Yeah, I mean, it's almost knowing when not to use <coughs> it. So, example, uh, when Manchester City signed Claudio Bravo because he could pass the football. No one had ever, in England, no one had ever kind of cared about goalkeeper passing. We'd collected goalkeeper passes for 10, 15 years, never really used it, but suddenly it was there when it was relevant, and we were able to suddenly, everyone was saying, oh, we want goalkeeper pass accuracy. Um, so we would never have pushed that out beforehand because no one would have cared. But it's about kind of just sitting on stuff and waiting for the right moment. But also because the sport changes, right? Uh, I mean, the goalkeeper role was something, and then uh, now and now it is uh, something else. So if you have this data, you can use it also to drive the conversation to to 
to new points. You guys, uh, th this is how the role has changed. And it's not only a goalkeeper, also the, the, the defenders and the midfielders and the strikers. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the bigger your data set and the, the longer it covers, the more you can pick out trends um, and the more you can kind of, you know, again, that goes back into the authenticity because then you're saying, look, we've got this data set that covers 20 years and it shows a distinct change in, in how the game's played. No, no, but, it, but, it, but it's great. The, the, the fact, though, is that even with the same data set, you might have different takes. And that's, uh, and that's totally fine, because uh, we think uh, even though we have the same numbers in front of us, uh, we come to different conclusions, right? Uh, I think uh, that a certain basketball player is the greatest of all times. Uh, somebody else uh, thinks that I'm wrong, and I'm talking about a colleague of mine. Um, so we talked about the fact that you're, Craig, you're now driving sort of the in-stadium experience professionally. But I think, Duncan, you've been kind of driving the sports broadcast conversation for years. So can you talk a bit about what inspired Off the Joe and, and how you've modeled your uh, stats, data, and frame around it? So, Yeah, I mean, Twitter obviously emerged in the, in the mid to late 2000s. And uh, back then, obviously, it was 140 characters. And we, well, I realized, I think, I think it was me, um, that it, lo basically we'd been producing loads of content that was about that length. Um, so me and a colleague basically said we should we should join this platform um, and it would be a really good kind of, because we, you know, we're B2B, like m you know, most of the guys here. and we don't really have much of a, of a channel with fans. And this was an, a, a, a chance to do it. Um, and yeah, we set it up and it was slow to start with. I think the, the 2010 World Cup was the first kind of social media tournament. Um, and that really sort of got the, the ball rolling. Um, and it's been kind of like the perfect combination, really. Um, it allows us to, to work out what fans like and, and more importantly, don't like, because they're quite quick to tell you when they don't like something. Um, and kind of realize quite quickly that stuff we thought that was really interesting, quite complicated stuff, didn't really resonate that much. And it's often the really simple things. And it's not necessarily data that would be unique to us or Delta Trey or Ace Pen or whoever, it's just the speed you can get, out, get it out with. And I guess one of our USPs is that we can get it out really fast. You know, if someone gets a hat trick in three minutes, we can push out the five fastest hat tricks within a, you know, 30 seconds. And it's when you can get stuff out first that you own the conversation and then it's kind of a virtuous circle. What are the things you see on the horizon? So we talked about um, analysis of sport live. Right? So yesterday we were talking about how you can analyze the way the teams are actually progressing and playing and everything else. Um, we had a quick note about Formula One. Um, they're not just designing cars with artificial intelligence, they're designing their race strategy. Now, if this was working as good as humans, Kimi wouldn't have lost at Monza. But what are the things that excite you about how insights um, both human and computer powered are changing or evolving the sports experience. Things that you see on the horizon that matter because this is all great, what's next? So. Um, I think there's a bit of challenge and opportunity um, around fragmentation. I think it's not gonna go anywhere and you, you, you mentioned AI and uh, a few other things that are probably gonna make it even more drastic in in the time ahead. Um, I think for for major broadcasters and publishers, it's going to be more vital to actually concentrate on your core, and yes, take risks, but deviate too far at your own risk. I think in terms of I spoke more about the partnerships and understanding. Don't try and fake it. Um, like don't try and fake being a live scores provider for AFL. It's not our game. There is someone that you can partner with and bring your layer of authenticity onto that. So um, just, I guess, probably not deviating too far and in amidst all this fragmentation is probably going to be a huge challenge for us all, but I see massive opportunity for those that sit close to their core. 
Yeah, I think for us, we often use the professional sector as a kind of uh, development space ahead of the media. So I think something like Expected Goals has been with clubs for five or six years, but now we've pushed it out to the media. And I think we've got a number of things in the pipeline like that. Um, but again, you know, I think the where AI and stuff can help is scalability. You know, it's kind of, you still want human-led uh, decisions and, and kind of planning, but it's just been able to scale it on a massive scale. And I think, you know, we're actually g getting a lot more out of the data we've had for 10, 20 years just by kind of going through it again with, uh, with, with better techniques. We are kind of downstream or of this, meaning that uh, whatever kind of uh, improvement uh, you guys have uh, in terms of output, uh, our users will benefit. We will probably improve uh, in terms of searchability, what, what kind of conversations are uh, spiking uh, and what not. But I think that uh, <coughs> it's uh, really about uh, how we manage this conversation, how we start this conversation, and how we are able to corral this, uh, this attention around that. Um, as far, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as long as uh, this account, uh, which is, by the way, one of my favorites, it's not because he's here, it's true, but you guys are welcome also. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, really, uh, it, it's uh, really about uh, the quality of, of the output, and, uh, and, and the fans will benefit from that. They will uh, talk uh, more, they will be more engaged, and again, the whole production value will benefit, will, uh, will uh, rise. The value of everything will rise up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there's all, good, all good stuff there. I think from our side, um, uh, we kind of restrict ourselves a little bit to speed to market with data because we tend to merge it with video to create a more immersive experience. So technology for us is going to be, you know, um, ultra low latency video delivery to kind of bring that much closer to meet broadcast to be as quick as um, everything we're doing, which is, I think, quite an interesting challenge. Um, but I think coming back to, uh, you know, one of the points there is that I think we also need to, I don't want to use the word ego, but I think we also need to understand our fan or continue to understand our fan better. So I think it's the insight back the way, the data back the way that's probably going to be more important in the next couple of years to continue to go back to the 10-year-old data or whatever it, it may be because ultimately the things that trend the most are the unique stories that have history that you know he's never scored a free kick in however many games or whatever so for us it's it's and we and because where we sit we have to do the data in both directions it is the insights and the, and the knowledge from the consumer and how they're changing particularly in, in for us in APAC where you know you have very very different markets like the the behavior in Indonesia is incredibly different to Singapore um, to the Philippines to wherever and you can't just package them all as what as one um, you know coming coming back to your point so I think for us it's it's that learning whether it's machine learning AI human learning it has to be that way for us. Yeah, I think you have to remember that things are constantly changing. And you kind of have to remember how football fandom is changing as well. I mean, you know, young fans now often follow um, players rather than teams. I mean, there was one guy on Twitter, actually, that claims he follows a position on a pitch, which seems a little bit too much for me. But um, the, uh, I mean, we saw with Ronaldo when he moved from Madrid to Juventus, not only did Juventus gain loads and loads of new fans on Instagram, Twitter, etc., but Real Madrid lost like four million. So Neymar to PSG didn't have the same same effect, right? Yeah. So, so it's just Ronaldo was ten pair, I think. Right? Neymar did have the same effect. That's so Ronaldo's so much better. Yeah. So that's a that's a new phenomenon um, that you would basically just switch clubs because your favourite player has moved. Um, and so you, yeah, you have to constantly be aware that nothing stays the same. And that um, layer of adaptability as well, I think um, important to note that you must adjust to, to the fan and I think a, a classic example for us is we, we may remain strong to our flagship, the Sports Centre program across the world. Um, we've got a local edition of it now in the Philippines with TV5. We have one in sub-Saharan 
Africa with uh, Quasar ESPN partnership over there. But what they've done over there is they've adapted it to a 10 to 15 minute format, which is getting much more traction. You can't just sit there. Yes, it might be fine for our traditional flagship to sit as a half hour program for TV5 in the Philippines, where we have a market that still has TV growing, one of the few in the world still. But um, you must adapt. So for the likes of Quasar ESPN, this 10 minute sports center has been an absolute hit for us. All right. It, excellent conversation. I've sat in the boardroom and had to justify everything around delivery. If Insights as a Service is so critical to the fan experience, how do you sell it to me? So I want to be your board member. You want to do the next, let's say, 2020 Olympics. What do you want to do? What's your voice? And how do you sell it? What's the value of Insights to a broadcaster who's also doing digital? Why is this important? Pitch me. OK, well, look, it, clearly the, it comes back to the fan experience. But I think if you're in the boardroom, what's going to matter? The commercial elements are clearly going to matter. Brands are gravitating towards audience segmentation. They do, scale is not as big a deal as it used to be. Yes, it's still important, but that audience segmentation and targetability that these elements of what we've been discussing today can deliver so is far more important. Yes, okay. indeed. I think you'd also point out that um, if you want to kind of leverage the history of the, you know, of the competition, so you want to bring in, you know, younger fans won't have heard of most of the Olympians that are great Olympians. With insights, you can basically open up a whole world of, of kind of storytelling that brands are going to love, that fans are going to love, and it kind of you know, makes the whole thing kind of a, a closed package that everyone wants to buy into. Um, it's a combination of both for us, at least, uh, in my view. We want to create more conversations that will lead to more opportunities to monetize. Because let's not forget to the previous point. We are talking to a global audience. It's true that we have to tailor certain uh, messages uh, to certain local uh, uh, audiences. But the fact that the Ronaldo moves from one place to another is not uh, shifting uh, the Spanish fans uh, from Real Madrid to Juventus. It's moving uh, all these uh, six million new followers that are outside of there. So every time that, uh, that we create a piece of information and we, we are kind of engaging uh, the, the global audience every single time. There are going to be stories that are more important than others, but uh, we, we need to be mindful that whatever we put out there, unless we geo-block it, uh, and that's a choice, this, is going, this might be picked up by somebody else, and all of a sudden you have 100,000 people talking about it. I, I, I think, um, obviously, we come from a technology side more than anything, so it, it, it's... To put all this together, it, it's not easy. I think everybody in this room have, have been burnt by live sport. It, it's, it's not delivering VOD. Um, it is live. It, you know, even, even in like the Asian Games where, you know, because one of the venues had closed, they started to de-rig. But of course, it's a completely connected system, so everything goes down. So it, it's the reliability. It, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the trust in, in the supplier, I think, is going to be key and knowing what to do with all the partners around to create that, that experience that's going to that's gonna stand up. Because ultimately now, fans will just switch off if it doesn't work. Um, they want it now, and, and if it doesn't, well, they expect it because of the Netflixes work perfectly. Um, and and if, you, if you can't do that in sport, I think you start to lose your audience <laughs> as the lighting goes down. So, um Delivering a broadcast experience that doesn't add data and insights to it is really kind of not what fans want. You said earlier, fans are demanding this kind of richness of information and sharing, and each of you is part of that ecosystem that delivers it. So final thoughts, value of insights as a service. What are the things you think make you happy every day? Uh, my, my credo was, you know, anywhere, anytime, any screen sports. What are you doing for the fan? What excites you about you can deliver in the next 24 months? What's the thing that actually gets you out of bed? 
Oh, well, well, I work in sport and I'm very passionate about it, so it's an easy one to bounce out of bed for. Um, what excites me the most, I think, um, this delivering this local, we talk about localization and we take it so seriously at ESPN and I think you, big companies can be very guilty of coming in and forcing localization from the top down um, within a country and I think what we are very carefully trying to do is partner with the likes of a media corp or a TV5 and come from the ground up, understand they know their markets better than anyone, um, listen to them and then come and apply our own layer as to how we can go about that. Um, data and insights are at the core, absolutely, of, of, of it all. Um, so I, right through to the multiple studio programs that we remain committed to, so it's, it's not going anywhere and I think digital is just going to take that even further. Uh, I think for me, for us, I think the, you know, kind of empowering the fan is the, is the thing really. So we've come from a world where, you know, the, the old phrase, if you haven't played the game, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, now people can know what they're talking about and there are, there's space now for other opinions and, you know, people can become experts. Um, in a slightly more democratized way, I guess. Um, you, st you know, excellence, I guess, has a has a space to shine, and I think, you know, data plays a big part in that. Um, and it's kind of making sure that data isn't just numbers on a screen. It's that it is stuff that we like we talked about earlier that you're going to talk about in the pub. You know, ultimately, everyone wants to come across like they know stuff, and you know, hopefully, we can keep making that happen. Um, as long as these guys keep on producing the top quality content uh, uh, and they use uh, the platform, that's great. Uh, for us, the challenge is being able uh, to stay true to what we want to do, which is uh, serving the conversation. Uh, everything that we do, uh, you heard Maya yesterday, uh, our, uh, our VP for the region saying, uh, start with them, and them is our users. For us, is being able to deliver their content, which is great, top quality, in the right way to the right people so that we can have more conversations. Awesome. Yeah, I think more advancements in the way we use data to empower the fan to control the experience, you know, um, multiple camera angles and, and bringing more of that in. I think for me, what what I realize we're very fortunate and we've all been there is we've had the, the, the joy of being in the stand at, at the live event. And I think the more that we can put that to the home fan as well, in however that may be, um, it, it, it's, it's definitely something to get out of bed for. And I think we'll, you know, by Tokyo 2020, we'll be you know, much closer to, to that for sure. Awesome. Please, can we give a big thank you? There's no way we could enjoy sports and entertainment as much without these four guys. Thank you so much for being here. Today.